the 10th of August, and I have the pleasure of interviewing my friend Sam Uden at his home at 23 Gray Hollow Road in Norwalk, Connecticut. Well, Sam, uh, get a little background information from you. Uh, you were born in Stanford? Yes. And what year? 1929. Uh -huh. And Stanford Hospital wasn't what it was, what it is now. It was quite different. And uh, who was your doctor? Dr. Lemoyne, of course. Uh -huh. And uh, your parents, were they born in this country? No. My Where mother was born in, in uh, Russia, in uh, um, what is it? Um, below Russia. Uh, I miss, I'm missing something here. Well, maybe we'll come back to you. No Babrusk. Yeah, Babrusk is in, um, is a little village or a little mm -hmm. dwarf in, uh, Belarus. In Belarus, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and your dad? Was My he... father was born in, in Poland in a little little village called Disney. Uh -huh. And he did work in, uh, in, um... Vilnius. Well, Vilnius was one of the, the uh, yeah, that was... That was not Poland, that was... Uh, Lithuania. Lithuania, yeah. And he came here when he was uh, 19. 19 years old. Was he already married when he came here? No, no. He, he, he and mother? some other gentlemen took off from the uh, Tsar's uh, army. Uh, they were going to be... And they were going to be in the Tsar's army, and they decided to take off. I think there was three or four of them that all left. What they did was, they went from Poland into Germany and bribed the, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, bribed the um, German uh, border people to let them into Germany, <coughs> which they did, and uh, <coughs> one of his <coughs> excuse me. One of his relatives in Stanford had given him a third-class uh, steamship ticket, mm -hmm. and so they they lived on herring for uh, the whole journey in in mm -hmm. steerage. Um, it's amazing. They were very sick when they got off the ship, as you can imagine. Yeah, they come through uh, Ellis Island. They came through Ellis Island, oh. yeah. And my mother came with. Uh, a cousin in New Haven and his wife, and I don't know their name, and I, I never met them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, the amazing thing about these uh, people that came from Europe, they did not, um, you know, their history was not really available. You just heard pieces of it like they were in a uh, war zone and they didn't want to talk about it. I don't know what the whole thing was about. And uh, therefore I didn't know the whole yeah. the whole thing. Do you have any idea where your parents met? If you, she in was New from, York. Uh, she was from New Haven and he was from Stanford? No, he, he, uh, he came with, his, with, the, his co with her cousin. My mo mother came with her cousins from the to New Haven, but then she went to New York, and she made her living as a seamstress. Mm -hmm. And my father was living in a boarding house there in New York somewhere, and, uh, probably on the west side somewhere in yeah. the Jewish area there. And uh, I don't know what he was doing. In Europe, he was a, uh, he worked in a drug uh, supply company. You know, that pharmaceutical. Yeah. Uh, and what he did in the United States, I don't know. But when he came to the United States, he was uh, the cousin or, or uh, that gave him the uh, steamship ticket at owned a dry goods store. Mm -hmm. And he worked there for him as a uh, 
worker. And uh, was this cousin from Stanford or from New York? I I don't know if he was from New York or from yeah. Stanford. I, I really that's I don't. Did, I did don't your know. father come over alone? Did he have any brothers or sisters? Or? No, he came over with his friends, with his mm. buddies. And they all took off. The the problem was in in the Tsar's army, you were just cannon fodder. Mm. And the worst part was that, that there was terrible anti-Semitism anyway. So the army really didn't want Jews anyway, but uh, they took them as, uh, because they, um, they needed uh, more people in yeah. the army. But they really weren't too happy with having mm -hmm. Jews in the army anyway. Yeah. This was under the Tsar's uh, yeah. regime. Did your father have any brothers or sisters? He, from what I understand, he had a sister and a brother. Now, he may have had more relatives, but I, I'm not aware of no. all of this. And how about your, mo your mom? Did she have any other... Yeah, siblings? what happened with my mother, when she was, from what I understand, when she was a... Uh, she was 10 or, or 12 or something of that age, from what I can understand, she decided um, her mother had died. Mm -hmm. And she decided to leave, but, uh, and what they did was they apprenticed her to a dressmaker or a senior, and as a uh, learning to train. Mm -hmm. And she worked uh, as a uh, seam, you know, seamstress, and uh, she learned to make uh, dresses and clothes and things of that nature, which she did in New York, it seems. And then she met my father, and... Uh, I guess they decided to uh, get married and they moved to Stanford. And my father had relatives here, had an aunt here. Uh, his mother, my father's mother and Jake DeMoyton's mother were sisters. Oh. So my father and Jake were first cousins. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, of course, the more anybody would call him Jake, no one called him Jacob. Uh, it, was, uh, it was always Jake. Yeah. And he was a, uh, a lovable character. He was really a very, mm -hmm. very wonderful guy. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, growing up in Stanford. You were born in Stanford Hospital. I was born in Stanford Hospital, and we lived in the, uh, in the, uh, on the other side of the tracks, it mm -hmm. seems. We lived on Hawthorne Street. Uh, well, at least when I was born, we were living on Hawthorne Street, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a mixed uh, area. There were Jews there, and, and all kinds of people there, and so on. It was, it was a, what was the house like? Was it a, a tenement? Or? It was a six-family mm -hmm. uh, tenement, I guess. Mm -hmm. A cold water flat. Uh, the only heating system was in the kitchen. Uh, a stove was there that was supposed to give heat to the whole house, which is, was, was positively ridiculous. It was cold as hell there in, in the winter. And it wasn't the best uh, building either. You know? Yeah. And uh, that's what... How long did you live there? I lived there until I was, uh, until I went into the army. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1952. Um, 51, I believe it mm -hmm. was. And when I came out, um, I had already become engaged to my wife, and uh, we planned to get married. And so I said, well, look, let's get an apartment in Stanford, because I know Stanford. I've been here for a number of years, you know, I've been here 21 years or something like that. And so I go to uh, one of the I think it was Juno Construction or whatever they call them, so man and man yeah, was or something. Was, yeah. And I said, look, I'm just out of the army and I need an apartment. And uh, the guy says, oh, okay. And he pulls out this roll of paper and it was all the names of people that were looking for apartments. He said, You'll be on the end of it. But by the time you, you get an apartment, I won't be here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I said, oh, well, that's terrible. And so we, um, my future mother-in-law had some sort of connections in Norwalk. 
and uh, she was able to get an apartment for it, which, mm -hmm. which was all of sixty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But that how old were you when you got married? I was. Um, let me see. Let me think now. I must have been twenty-three. I mm -hmm. imagine. I think I was twenty-three. Mm -hmm. uh, it was amazing because you know the, the apartment rent and our salary was the same. No. You know, so obviously Harriet had to work yeah. to, to supplement the income. Uh, when you were living on Hawthorne Street, what schools did you go to? My first school was a little school called Elm Street School. It was a, uh, a little, uh, really uh, a very old school. And my brother, who was 11 years older than I, he had also attended that school. So you can imagine how old that school was. Mm -hmm. Now it's gone, of course. Uh, and then I went from there from the sixth grade to uh, Burdick Junior High School, which I understand isn't there anymore either. No, now that's an apartment house. Yeah. yeah. And then we finally went to uh, Stanford High School. And that, what year did you graduate Stanford High? 48. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember I had to register for the draft. It was the draft from the Second World War. And the day I registered, the next day the, the act died. Uh -huh. It was amazing, uh -huh. it was positively amazing. Uh, it was funny because uh, that, 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 that's the sequence of events that happened. And then you went on to college after that? After that, well, I, I had a couple of jobs that I didn't like. I um, looked in the paper and jobs were scarce. I figured, you know, I was a uh, sergeant first class in the Army and my MOS was uh, Signal Corps and so on and so on. And I figured, gee, that, there must be a, a field there where they need uh, trained people from the, uh, you know, that, that did this kind of work. But, you know what, there wasn't any jobs, not, mm -hmm. nothing. So I did have a couple of little things in which I didn't, I detested, detested office work. And I finally got a job at the American Machine of Foundry in Springdale. They had a uh, research mm -hmm. section there. And on the same day at time, I was going to uh, the University of Bridgeport and I was working towards a degree in uh, Chemistry. Chemistry seemed to be a, an, an ideal field for me. My brother was an electrical engineer, and anything I wanted was not elect electronics. I wanted uh, chemistry. And I used to work during the day and run to Bridgeport at night. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I took all kinds of chemistry courses and took uh, uh, courses in history. I must have had a minor in history at that point. But as time went on, they, AMF decided that I, I, they needed me at a pilot plant in Brooklyn. Well, running from, taking a train from Brooklyn, taking two subways, mm -hmm. then take a train back to Connecticut and running to, to Bridgeport to, to classes, wore me out completely. I was a goner at that point, so I had to quit. Uh, so I really never finished the uh, course. I did take management courses mm -hmm. at uh, the college here in uh, Norwalk. Norwalk, yeah. And, yeah it was very, everything was very interesting and everything, but you know, you can't burn the candle on both sides, not for mm -hmm. long anyway, because you're going to go out. <laughs> Your flame is going to go out completely. So I never really finished, but I enjoyed it every every bit of it. Mm -hmm. I remember working in the lab at uh, in Bridgeport, and uh, coming home, smelling of uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, mm -hmm. and my wife and Harry would look at me in the garage. We were living in uh, in West Norwalk at the time on. Um, off Pomus Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, she would meet me there and said, 
before you come in the house, take all your clothes off. You smell of rotten eggs. I said, yeah, that's, that's sulfur dioxide. Yeah. She said, well, I don't care what it is. Mm. You can't come into the house like, with that smell. I yeah. have to take all my clothes off and come into the house. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And, uh, it was good to get away from the sulfur dioxide, I'll tell you. So what was your next job? Then I um, continued working at AMF, and I had, at one point, when I just got out of the Army, I had registered with an employment agency in, in Stanford. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later, I got a call. They need, they need someone at uh, Hicks and Otis in Norwalk. I said, what on earth is that? Well, they were doing shower curtains and things of that nature. And before I knew it, I was working in the, uh, in color and doing development work for them. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, I had no color experience whatsoever, but I soon found out how to match colors and do, uh, do all this kind of work. And before I knew it, I was running the, uh, the color room and the, uh, lab and everything. And I stayed there for about uh, four years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I heard of a, uh, there was an advertisement in the uh, local paper, in the Advocate, I guess it was, that they wanted a guy in uh, Ross and Roberts in Stratford to do color work. They wanted a colorist. I said, mm -hmm. oh, boy, this let me see what that's about. And I go up there, and sure enough, they want me. They say, "What's your experience? We really need you. We're starting a. We're going to be do printing and uh, on Bible and so on. And you have all this experience and ink matching and everything." So I got a job there, where I had to go to uh, Stratford every day. Well, that was a lot easier going to school than until it was much easier, and I kept on taking courses at. Uh, Bridgeport and so on, and um, I finally, I the the job at uh, at Ross and Roberts became uh, more than I really wanted, but I stayed, and uh, I, again I had to stop with the courses because I had to spend hours there. Uh, I used to get phone calls at three o'clock in the morning. Where is this? Where is that? And my, my wife used to yell out, you, you want to know where the toilet paper is? Well, what they were doing is that they were running all, they were running three shifts there in the color and, and foam uh, areas. And uh, I was responsible. So I used to go in at three in the morning to see what the hell was going on. I'd come in there and there'd be seven guys sitting there because they didn't know what to do next. And I walk in there and they think I'm going to straighten all the problems out in, mm -hmm. in the next three minutes. Well, we would finally uh, look into everything and try to find, you know, go through all the procedures and everything and find out what the hell is going on. So in 15 or 20 minutes we had things going again. So it's 3 o'clock in the morning, there's no sense me going home because at 7 o'clock they start again. So I would stay there, so I ended up doing 12 hours a day or 13 hours a day there, which uh, was difficult. And before you know it, I uh, came down with a, a case of, uh, uh, what the heck was it? Well, my eyes started to turn um, yellow, and uh, I did have a, a a liver problem at that point. You know, my liver went Jones. bananas. And uh, I was out for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. until, uh, until it subsided, until I got rid of it. Uh, and at that point, um, they put you in quarantine because you were mm -hmm. so infectious, you know, the infections. Yeah. Um, and finally I got back to work and everything was fine. And working and working. And we're doing automotive matching and this, which is the worst kind of matching you can possibly do. And, and uh, it was very trying, quite trying. And, um, 
we had we were making expanded vinyl foam for upholstery and different summary items. And the guy that was doing it, uh, I was doing the printing and so on, you know, the inks and for printing and all this kind of thing, um, uh, had a heart attack. And I'm sitting in my office there and contemplating what we're going to do next with this, you know, out with the printing and the mm -hmm. inks and everything. I had to try to find out what we're going to do there. And the guy that was the technical director comes in and says, you know what? You now are running the foam also area where you were going to make uh, vinyl foam. And I said, but I don't know a thing about it. He said, that's where I learned. That's how, you, that's how you find out. So that day I became, I got that job and I, uh, I did do research and so on. And mm -hmm. I found out what the hell was going on, what we were what we did was we were making compounds that would release nitrogen at a certain temperature, and uh, that would make bubbles in the in the in the foam. So when you see um, vinyl foam or any kind of foam, the bubbles are made with nitrogen. So what is that product? The end the end product. What are they using? The end product was used in shoes. Oh. It was used in handbags. It was used in upholstery. Naga hide. We made a, a, a material like Naga hide. Mm -hmm. Naga hide was just a a, a a name, a trade name. Yeah. But it, but it was just nothing more than vinyl foam with a piece of vinyl sheet mm -hmm. laminated to it. And uh, I said, look, uh, it's you know, we're we're spending a lot of money for these processes, you know, for everything. And, so I started to do more development work and we cut our expenses in, in raw materials. It was amazing. This same material is, uh, that we use to make nitrogen, a similar one uh, is used in making bread, to make bubbles in the bread. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was funny because one day, um, the material we were using was a very fine powder like a very granulated material, mm -hmm. but very, very fine, well, almost like talcum powder. Mm -hmm. The stuff they use in bread is larger particle size. And I, um, I said, well, this is ridiculous. You know, we're buying this stuff and it's costing a fortune. So I started looking for places where we could buy it cheaper. And of course, the uh, people that were salesmen and they were working with the company, you know, from different companies, and were buying lunch for everybody and, and Christmas presents and all that crap. And I refused. I refused to go to lunch with any of these guys because I didn't want to listen to nonsense for two hours. While they, uh, sure, they bought lunch for you, but then you got to listen to their nonsense. I don't want to hear that crap. Anyway, the funny thing was, a guy comes in from one of the big chemical companies, a German chemical company. And he had a, a German accent, of course. And he said, uh, you're Jewish. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I am. He says, well, you know, I'm German, but my wife is Jewish. And I said, fine, I think that's very commendable. He says, I hope you won't buy, you'll buy my material, even though we're, we're a German company. And I said, you know, let me tell you something. I would buy this material from the devil if he came in and gave me an economic price. The guy almost passed out, mm -hmm. and I never heard from him after that. Yeah. So how many years did you work there? I worked there for 37 years, believe yeah. it or not. It was a very good reason why I, I did have offers to move to uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey and all over. But you know, we had my parents were getting older. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law and father-in-law were older. And we had, uh, my wife's aunt was here, and we really didn't want to leave the area yeah. because of all the... Uh, and your children the, were going to school. And the children yeah. were going to school right across the street from here almost, you know, mm -hmm. down the, at uh, Silvermine Elementary School. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was great. But um, I said, ah, oh, look, what I'm going to gain, we're going to lose in the long run. Yeah. And we had just bought a new home here, this, this house. You know, on, on uh, 
Great Hollow Road, and mm -hmm. uh, we really didn't want to destroy everything and run off to Jersey or yeah. somewhere else. How much did you pay for the house? Do you remember? Yeah, it was <laughs> it was a terribly expensive house at that time. Mm -hmm. It cost all of thirty seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Can you believe that? What year was that about? Well, we're here forty five years. 45, 45 years, so it would have been 64. Years, I guess, 49 years. Yeah. It was, a, it was a, one of the last good areas in uh, Norwalk. There's some other good ones, but this was one of the good ones. Yeah. We enjoyed living here. And mm -hmm. We really were reluctant to leave. Even though financially I would have done much better in, uh, in uh, other areas. Mm -hmm. Because of my background and experience yeah. and all this kind of stuff. But, look, that's water under the dam right. at this point. Yeah. And, uh, of course, what we spent for the house, we've more than tripled what we've put into it of at course. this point. You know, we've, we've yeah. no one would even recognize this house uh, uh, at this time. Yeah. The builder was a very good, was an honest builder, mm -hmm. a very honest guy. But, uh, we've made a lot of changes, huge changes. Yeah. So, uh, tell me, uh, your children, Lynn and Mark, went to the elementary school here? Then yes, they, then, then they the went school? to, um, oh, you mean, oh, they went to uh, West Rocks. Oh, okay. That That's was the, um, intermediate mi school. the middle school, yeah. West Rocks. Mm -hmm. And from there they went to Stanford High School. Norwalk High. Norwalk High School, I mean, not Stanford. Stanford, I went to Stanford. Mm -hmm. the, the amazing thing was that I walked in there one day uh, in the high school, and I, I see the teachers are having trouble getting through the hall. The kids just don't move out of the way when they walk, when the teachers are there. There was no, uh, I said, what the hell is this? What is this? Uh, what kind of nonsense is this? You know, the kids have no real respect for the kid, for the teachers. Now, I don't know if it's better now, maybe different now, but it was just terrible at that time. Yeah. Well, I wasn't happy with the way Norwalk High School was run at that time. One thing was, it was it's a very large school. Mm -hmm. What they, they were saving money by building a large one, what they should have done was build two smaller ones. It's easier to uh, yeah. control. And I think that one was just too big, much too large. But that was the, they wanted, didn't want to spend the money for two buildings, so they, they uh, built that huge one. Which I guess they were right, and at that time they probably didn't have enough money to do two of them. Well, I guess uh, one of the important parts of this interview is going to be about your relationship with Jake Nemoyton, the country doctor who was so well remembered in Stanford. He, re he delivered me, he delivered you, and uh, I can remember sitting in his office as a, as a youngster and how everybody loved him and he just loved people. He was uh, like a godlike uh, uh, figure. He always reminded me of Santa Claus for some reason because he was uh, a large person. He wasn't, wasn't, he wasn't thin. And uh, he was just such a nice man, uh, a great person. Uh, I really feel uh, happy that I, was, that I knew him and that I was able to go out, go out with him. I told you the story about uh, we were going to his farm and we wanted to stop and take some pictures. He was a picture addict, play, you know, mm -hmm. a photography addict like myself. And we saw a wall, you know, a stone wall. And I said, well, maybe we can sit on the stone wall. He says, yeah, we can do that. I said, we can't really climb over the wall on the guy's property. He says, well, you can, no, you can't really do that. But he saw a sign, the guy's name was McCann. So he decided that McCann, in Yiddish, is McCann. He says, McCann, we, jump over, so we jumped over the wall, 
and we took pictures on the guy's mm -hmm. uh, state, and uh, no one seemed to care, evidently. Uh, but it was funny the way he interpreted McCann to McCann. Yeah. He was really he was very comical in some respects. Very nice, really a nice, very wonderful guy. I, I, I already had uh, a lot of fun with him. Uh, I know uh, one time you were telling me uh, your, what your dad was doing for a living in Stanford and how Dr. Nemoyton used to take him on his house calls. Yeah, they were cousins and uh, uh, my father during the Depression lost his job. And uh, he became a uh, commission salesman, and uh, which was, you know, was all right. But you know, things were very tough, and uh, we would wait for him to come home to, to uh, with some money so we could go and buy food. What was he commission salesman for? He used to sell uh, uh, shoes to the guys in the uh, that did work in in garages and places like that. Mm. And the soles were neoprene so that oil and grease and and mm. the, all these different materials would not hurt the uh, shoes. And he sold them in the factories. He had factory accounts and mm. so on. He did reasonably well, I guess. Uh, during the war, of course, uh, shoes were rationed and you had to have a a uh, stamp, you know, a ration stamp, mm -hmm. and people uh, that were uh, that had no regard for the uh, war or that the people were fighting would buy stamps from from different crooks. My father refused to do that, and we always asked, "Why did you do?" It? He said, "Because it wasn't proper. I'm not going to do that thing." Mm -hmm. So, consequently, his business. Uh, Suffered from that type of thing. But how did he get around? Did he have a car, or did he go? Live? No, he never had a car. He never drove. Uh -huh. He would use buses and uh, rail transportation to get around, and uh, and he'd walk. He, he was a uh -huh. great walker. He would walk from uh, Hawthorne Street to Atlantic Street to the post office. Mm -hmm. And that was quite a walk, but he did well at it. And in later years, as time went on, uh, he wasn't as agile. And uh, we finally convinced him to use a cane. And he fell a couple of times. Once he broke his nose, and once he broke, he destroyed his arm. And uh, when we asked him what happened, he says, uh, a um, devil pushed me. What are you talking about, a devil pushing? Yeah, I, mean, I was crossing the street, and when I came to the curb, the devil pushed me. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, it's all right. Did you, you tell me one me. time that he used to go with the horse and buggy with Jake to go to different neighborhoods? Yeah, well, that was his cousin, and they were, they were, uh, they were big friends. They were mm -hmm. big buddies. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, of course, Le Moyne was more was a very was a more successful than my father, mm -hmm. but uh, look, the old man did the best he could, I guess, with what he what he was able to handle at that point. Right. But Jake was a real friend. Uh, Do you have any other anecdotal stories to tell us? About yeah, we were with, with well. Jake? One time we were out out on a photography mission, and we stopped for. Uh, lunch at a little restaurant and Jake always had a pad and a pencil and what happened was we're sitting there and he takes out his pad and he starts sketching and there was a gal at the bar you know at the uh, uh, bar there at the lunch place and he was sketching her it was quite a good likeness and then she saw that he was drawing her and she walked out. <laughs> he was very upset about that because he hadn't finished his little sketch. He didn't understand he used to do that when patients came in. He would, yeah. he would take them into the little room on the side and, yeah. and sketch them. Well, he, was, he had a very loud voice. 
and the doors of his office were about three inches thick. I remember. At least three inches thick. Yeah. And when he talked to patients, you could hear everything he was saying because right through the three inch doors yeah. and the wall and everything. And uh, I guess his wife and his son used to caution him, don't to speak so loud, you know, because everybody can hear what you're saying, you know. No one really is interested in what you're saying, but you can hear everything, you know. But that didn't stop him. That's the way he spoke, and that was it. You know, he didn't shout, but he had a very yeah. loud voice. Yeah, I can remember sitting in his waiting room and hearing him discuss with patients uh, <laughs> one that uh, this is a very serious operation. Yes. And, yeah. And everybody doesn't survive, but my son Bernard, <laughs> the surgeon, uh, he has never lost a patient yet. Well, I told you the story about uh, his son with the uh, gypsy. No, I don't remember that one. It seems that um, he was busy. Uh, the guy from Barton's, that owned Barton's Candies Company, was visiting with a friend of mine, the parents. And these, these um, steps were made out of stone of the house. And they were going out for, uh, uh, they were going to the temp, to the shul. Because the guy was very religious and, this, mm -hmm. and they were all very religious people and so on. And it was in the winter and there was ice on the steps evidently or, very, or snow or something of that nature. And um, the, um, they come out of the house and they, Start walking down the steps, and the guy that owned Barton's evidently slipped, fell down a couple of, I don't know how many steps, maybe with four or five steps, mm -hmm. and he broke a leg. And there he is lying on the uh, concrete path, and, and they said, Well, look, we got to call an ambulance and take you to the hospital. He says, No, I don't drive on uh, Friday, I'm very religious. Well, we can't just sit and lay on the ground here. Well, the ambulance evidently came and uh, the paramedics said, well, we're going to take you, we'll put you on a, on a uh, gurney and take you to the hospital because you, you, have a, you evidently have a problem. Well, they finally called Dr. Des Moines, the, the, the son, uh, Bernie Des Moines. And Bernie looks at the guy and says, you know, you have a bad fracture here. I want to take you to the hospital and fix it. You know, do something with it because I can't do it out here with you lying on the, on the uh, concrete walk here. That you can't do anything there. Well, the guy says, no, I can't, can't drive on, on, uh, on uh, Friday night. It was Friday night. And we're going to the show, you know. Bernie says, well, you know, you're not going to get to, you can't walk to the show, you can't walk to the hospital. We've got to, we've got to do something. Well, anyway, uh, the guy refuses, and Bernie evidently said to him, the last time I had a problem like this is when the, uh, the gypsy, well, a gypsy had a, he had a penicitis, and I had to call the gypsy king in Boston to get permission to operate on him. I said, if you think I'm going to go through that, you're crazy. And he told the guys, the paramedics, put him on a gurney, take him to the hospital, we gotta fix his leg, whether he wants it or not. Can't just let him stay here on the, on the ground. Well, that's happened, and they took him to the hospital. Of course, he was all right after that. But the guy went against his will, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people with this uh, religious fervor, uh, they, uh, yeah. they do that. What can I tell you? You uh, showed me this letter yeah. that uh, you received, and uh, why, why don't you just read it? I think it's such a wonderful piece of memorabilia. It, it, it was a letter to my, uh, my future father-in-law, because he had sent Jake Des Moines an uh, invitation to, a, to the uh, wedding. It says, I... I have received your invitation to your, it's hard for me to read this, oh, to your daughter's wedding, who will happily 
marry my cousin, young Juden, it says. I guess we were, uh, since he was a first cousin to my father, I guess mm. he was a second cousin to me. Right. Um, it says, however, let's see, it is impossible for me to, to be present as I have advanced in years and have a heart condition, yeah. Doctors are known for not being able to well, write. That is handwriting, isn't it? What does this say? I am at my office, and only part time. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I sincerely that's... wish them all happiness. Please let me know their residence address. So something. So there. I can communicate with them. Yeah, some very way. truly yours, Jake. The morning very. dated March. Third, 1954. He, he was a great uh, guy. What I never understood is how they could read the, uh, his prescriptions because of the way he wrote, it was very difficult to uh, read that stuff. <coughs> now I can see why the... Um, the pharmacists always call the doctors and ask them what the hell they want on the prescriptions because their their writing is so poor. They'd be better off printing. Uh, what about this uh, picture that's behind you, Sam? Right, that that was a picture of my father. Uh, it's a painting of my father that Dr. Moynton made from a photograph. And. Mm. Um, he surprised my father one day by uh, giving it to him, and, and that was the uh, word on that. It's not a, uh, the fact is, because it was on a photograph, I think it, it's not really uh, um, a 3D type of thing, you know, it's, it's more or less of a flat uh, plane. My son, who's a, uh, expert in painting seems to think it's a very good picture of him, a very good likeness of my father. Well, I recognized it as soon as I saw it because I remember your dad. Yeah. I, I thought that um, it would have been better perhaps if he had done it from... Uh, uh, now, from I'll tell you, uh, Sam, I, I've life. seen many of uh, Jake's uh, <laughs> paintings uh, from, from people sitting for the painting or in his office, and they don't look any different. <laughs> yeah, well, his style, I think, was antique or something like that. It was, uh, he, 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 if he hadn't been a doctor, I think he would have been an artist. Probably well, a very good one, too. And his drawings were very beautiful, very good. That, that's a picture of, um, of Jake Des Moines at his farm. It was taken at his farm, and he he had my camera. What? what uh, it was a Ciroflex it? camera. Uh, Let double, me get a little closer. On double that. lens Ciroflex, uh -huh. and he was taking a picture of me at that time. And I had another camera, and I took a picture of him while he was doing it. About 1946 at New Milford. Was, the, uh, the, was this the same day? The same day, yes. And this is, um, see, he has his camera there, and he's resting because he was tired. Uh, it was hard work uh, walking for him. He had diabetes, and um, his shoes were two sizes larger than, than what he would normally wear because of the diabetes uh, um, bothered his feet. That was one of 
That was that same day that we took those movies. Uh, photographs, I mean. So there's another thing there, there's one there that shows the, uh, the building where he was, where he uh, lived on Main Street there. Or was it South Main Street? Was it South Main Street, East Main Street? No, it was Main Street. Was it's it just Main Street? Main Street? Yeah. And that building there, uh, it was very interesting uh, type of building because the front was made out of small stones rather than large ones. And um, I've never seen anything quite like that before. I think that was one of the reasons that he, wanted, he bought it, because of the uh, idea that was made out of little stones in the front. Well, now that uh, we've gotten some details of your background and your relationship with Dr. Nemoyton. Uh, it was a very good relationship. He, yeah. he was a very, very good man. I, uh, Are there any uh, reflections on the changes that we have both seen in our lifetime from when we're growing up to the present day? Well, you, Stanford has completely changed, obviously. It was a... Um, a small Stanford at that time was a small, uh, little quiet little uh, city. Of course, there was two uh, parts to it. There was a town and a uh, city which was stupid also, because they duplicated services. Uh, but it was a very uh, quiet little, little city, and especially during the Depression. Uh, and uh, there was no large buildings, of course. In fact, uh, there, were no, there was no building at all because of the Depression. Things were very bad. And, uh, Buildings that had been started were just left, were just abandoned. Uh, I remember that very, very carefully. Uh, that that uh, that's that's what happened. And I remember the war, the war came. That the man that built Woodside Village, yeah, committed suicide because he couldn't rent any of the places. Well, because uh, it was just a, a horrible time. Yeah. Then the the war in Europe started about 1939, of course with uh, Hitler uh, invading Poland and um, the United States was getting ready for war because of being prepared and the British were really being beat to death there and we, uh, things were very bad at that time. Uh, I remember the um, people that when they had uh, relatives in the army or navy, they would have little flags in their windows of, of uh, with a blue star, mm -hmm. a red border with a blue star, and a white, white, white field with a blue star on the white field. However, every once in a while that flag would change and there'd be a gold star in the, mm -hmm. on the white field and uh, then you know that one of their people, one of their relatives or one of their, uh, uh, part of their family was destroyed in the, in the uh, war. And my mother uh, lost uh, most of her uh, family during the war. And I imagine my father did too. Uh, I don't know, you know, this, I was very young at the time. I really didn't understand the whole uh, consequence of all these things. It was, uh, and my mother got very ill over this thing. She really, very, she got very upset and uh, had a nervous collapse over this whole thing. And my father, I don't know what he was doing, he was working as best he could, I guess. And it was just a, uh, a horrible uh, time. And uh, people who are neighbors uh, lost sons and, and people and from their family, and it was just, 
it was just a terrible to read the uh, paper and see the lists of people who were no longer going to come back. Friends of mine uh, lost brothers and, and uh, uncles and so on. It was a horrible, horrible time. And uh, the war went on and on, of course, and until around 19, I guess 1944, it was over with it, in, in Europe anyway. And uh, then, then the thing was to destroy Japan. And it just went on and on. It just never stopped, it seemed to me. And then finally, uh, it was over. Japan had surrendered after they dropped a couple of atomic bombs on their major cities. And, and uh, that was the end of that. And then we had a war period, a period where reconstruction was going on and so on and so on. And, and before I knew it, um, uh, there's another war going on in, in uh, Asia, uh, the Korean problem. It was called a police action, but we lost 53,000 men there, and women, men and women. And uh, Uncle Sam said, you know, I need you. And I said, okay. But when I went to, uh, I remember going up to uh, Bridgeport for a pre-physical, and they took blood, of, and they had a huge, <laughs> syringe that they took blood and I passed out. Mm. Really, just completely remember mm. falling down. And Bob Allswine was with me at that time. And they were all laughing like mad, you know, that here, and this guy passes out. Well, anyway, um, I uh, ended up in the Army. And since I had hay fever and had terrible allergies, uh, I was considered the three profile, profile three, which was the cripple unit. Mm. And uh, I, I, I worked uh, as, a, as a wireman, a field wireman, learned uh, like some work on electricity and so on. Things got better. And I was shipped to uh, Newfoundland to uh, help uh, build a uh, communication line between the Air Force bases and so on. I was in the Army but attached to the Air Force. And I got out eventually, of course. And uh, we got married, my wife and I waited a year and then we got married. It was a... Uh, Where did you meet Harry? We never talked about it. It was funny. Um, we were... Um, I had a friend by the name of Al Wagner, who was a, a really nice guy, and another guy by the name of Phil Levine, another really old friend of mine. And we, for some reason, we, the, the, we always felt that the people in the other town were always better than the ones that, the girls in Stanford weren't as good as the ones in, in another town. So we went to Norwalk, and we met, uh, 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 different people there, and, and I was dating this young lady that was uh, really a very nice young lady, and Al Wagner was dating Harriet, my, my future wife, and um, as it worked out, Al went to college, took off to college, and I uh, was home, so one day I decided to call Harriet and see if she was available, and she was, and we went out, and before we know it, uh, we were going steady, and then we were engaged, and uh, I ended up in the Army. And she waited for me for two years until I got out of the Army. She would write me letters every day, she was really a, quite a gal. <laughs> And her mother would tell her, what are you waiting for this guy for? You know, he's going into the army and he's all away. Uh, he'll find some other girl there and that'll be the end of it. But she said, no, 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 she's going to wait. And, and she did wait for me for two years. How many years have you been married now? Um, 59.
kind of What year were you married? 19, uh, what was it? 50 something. 1953, I think it was. 53. So that would be 56 years. 56 years, all right. How about the changes in technology, all the things we've seen? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, always amazed me. Uh, the, the best thing we had was a, uh, a telephone. That was the big technology, uh, a black uh, telephone. Uh, and uh, it was heavy. Uh, and then finally, um, it got to the point, well, it was years later that, that they finally uh, discovered how to make the phone smaller. And there was no television at that time. The best you could do was radio. And um, I always liked music, so I had a huge phonograph. Uh, I had those vinyl discs. Uh, I had a whole collection of them. And uh, then, then the, um, the discs became... Uh, obsolete and then went to tape and uh, finally we went to uh, discs again but smaller ones which were very com uh, very compact CDs are very compact you know it was amazing and then even in the lab we we, uh, we used to do things by uh, we had to do everything by uh, you know we mixing solutions every and the, uh, the only tools we really had was a pH meter, I think. Mm -hmm. And now we have digital scales. We had these big balances, these big uh, uh, balances where you try to weigh things up on them. And it was mm -hmm. just a horror. Now with the digital scales, it's, it's, it's nothing, you know. No, I don't know anybody uses those big balances yeah. anymore. In fact, I have one downstairs that I never use. It was just a uh, souvenir of all the years that I put into the lab work. But uh, I don't think anybody uses them anymore. Uh, now everything is digital. Of course, there was television came in, and only the very rich people that could afford it bought it because it was very expensive at that time. And the amount that programs, I mean, you get about three hours a day, I think, of mm. programming. And, uh, and the refrigerator, my, I remember we had an icebox. And my father went and finally went out and bought a uh, refrigerator. And you know, the icebox, the ice would melt and you'd have a pan underneath the icebox and the water would get in there and overflow because you forgot to take the damn pan out and empty it. And, uh, it was an ice, I remember the ice man with uh, a little guy would, uh, would come down the street shouting ice, ice, and all the women would, uh, had cards, big cards, and they put one in the window uh, if they wanted ice. And you could get a piece for uh, 20 cents or 30 cents or yeah, I think that was 20 or 30 cents. Mm -hmm. The only problem was no one had 20 cents or 30 cents, so we'd end up with a 20 cent piece all the time, and he would carry it upstairs and put it in the icebox. What a mess. It was just a, a damn mess. I remember a gal in the next house had an icebox, and she's a Jewish woman. And she was, uh, she had it out there, and her sons bought her a refrigerator, but she decided she's going to keep her icebox. Well, one day they come, they come over there on the third floor. She lived on the third floor, and they picked up the icebox and threw it right over the railing on, and landed on down in the yard downstairs mm -hmm. in pieces because she wouldn't give up her icebox. They they were funny, funny guys. I remember those cards for the ice. Yeah, and. You would turn it, it would say 10 cents, right. 20 cents, 30 yeah. cents, yeah. 40 cents, and whatever one was on top, 
the Iceman would know what, what that was the size yeah. block to bring exactly. into the house. And my mother always thought that the guy was cheating him, cheating her. <laughs> yeah. You know that he's giving her a small piece of mm -hmm. ice when the, she really should have been gotten a larger one, and and uh, it, was, it was a panic. Um, really a funny sit time at that at that. I was only a, I was a kid then, really very young kid. I really didn't understand all the problems that yeah. we were having. All I know, we were eating cornflakes like crazy, and why we were eating cornflakes was cheap. Right. And you could always get milk to some degree. You buy a day old bread and a little remember. bottle. You know, we 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 buy uh, quarts of milk, which is probably the most expensive way to buy milk. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was no, was no um, half gallons. Uh, yeah. You could buy a gallon, I guess, if you could afford it. I don't know who could afford it. And it would go bad in the refrigerator anyway, in the uh, icebox anyway. Well, Sam, I uh, think uh, we can wind it up, and I want to thank you very much. It was my for pleasure. giving us the time for the archives of the Jewish Historical Society. That. I, I, um, it was fun remembering some of the things that happened to us. It was positively amazing. Well, as we say, we don't know where we're going unless we remember where we've been. That's true. I, uh, one thing I learned in the Army, though, I'll tell you what it is. Never give up. Even though it looks black, don't give up. If you give up, you're lost.